ainsi prembe les disciples. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, if you can address me as such, actually like it. <laughs> we give God the glory. So today we're just going to be having a little discourse. Yeah, we're going to be having a little discussion today. And we're going to be talking about the life of our very beautiful King David that we like to talk about a lot. So we're going to discuss about him. There are wonderful things about his life that um, I would like us to, to discuss. Amen. I know we have a different understanding about who he is. We have a different concern. We have a different interest. They are part of him that, that gets to us most. So they are also part of him that gets to you most so first of all i'm going to start with us what do we know about king david so it's a class right what do we know about king david that i early <laughs> hallelujah what do you know about king david our very own king david praise the lord Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, like the Bible said, it was the heart of it was God Jesus' heart. He was the man who obeyed since he was a child. He, he obeyed. He obeyed God so much. I, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know, but yeah. yeah, I guess the point you're trying to make that King David was a man after God's heart. And yeah. obviously, that's what the scripture said. The scripture addressed him as a man after God's heart. That means he was dear to the heart of God. Amen. Indeed, that's whom King David is. King David is a man after God's own heart. That's what the Lord Himself said. Amen. It's not what we think, it's not our imagination. Okay, so what else? Who else? Okay, I'm the chief. <laughs> what do you know about our very own King David? King David, if I'm going to say he's, um, for me, he's like, I see, uh, when I look at the scripture, I see him in the Old Testament, I see him as the center of it, like, I, there is a lot I borrow from him, especially being that he authored the Bible, the, he, he authored the Psalm, most of the Psalms. He, he talks so much about God. He's so passionate about God. He gives descriptive detail of what the relationship with God is. I, I think he, if I'm to say, if I can use the word, my, if I use the word, um, a role model, someone I look up to. If there's any saint I want to meet here on earth before I get in heaven, I would like to meet King David. I want to, I, 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 I love the way he loves the Lord. He gives himself when he offers sacrifice, he gives it a thousand, and he gives thousands of gold. Let me stop there. David is a man, like our sister mentioned, he's a man after God's own heart. That's sum, that summarizes it all for me. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, yeah. It's a man after God's own heart. He's a role model. He's, um, he's gave a lot of description about who God is. I'm trying to recap what you said now. He gave a lot of description. He opened our eyes. He opened our understanding to how God can truly be like. Amen. I think we were talking about something else. Like, oh, God, the more we try to know him, the... The, the deeper he becomes. He gets. So King David is actually somebody that makes us to, he makes us to realize that should be, we're having a story about him where he killed Uzda for holding the ark. And we realize that this King David and, and God, they just had a husband and wife relationship. He was just like, oh, how could my husband do something like that? I'm not going to talk to him again. And then God have to bless obey the door just for King David to get jealous again and love on him again. You know, actually, he makes us to know that God is not so difficult to serve. That's it. He makes us to know that God is close and we can actually establish a relationship with God. Amen. So that's the life of King David. 
for I don't know if anybody else still has something to say. Okay. So maybe even if we're going to talk later, actually I've had this discussion with other people and they gave their points. So I'm just going to bring out some of the points. I don't want to take credit for it. So that's why I'm saying it. I'm just going to recap some of the points and we're going to expansiate them a little bit more. Actually, somebody said David Kid Goliath, which is very, very true. <laughs> David Kid Goliath, and that's one thing that we have always known. And now talking about David killing Goliath, not just the art. It is the thing that backs up the art, okay? Before I'm going to say, um, um, I'm not going to say it now. I'm going to say, oh, um, mm, I'm okay, so, so and so, somebody get married to the president. Oh, how did she find her way into that? Let me say king. Oh, he came, get married to the king. He became the, the second wife or he made the king to love her. You know, you're going to be like, where how did she, what happened, what come about it? So there are things that backs up this person's action. There are things that made it possible to be so. Now, in the process of David killing Goliath, there were a lot of things that, that went down. Actually, I realized during my study with the children, I just realized that David was a man of faith and he was bold. It was, he didn't kick Goliath with just a mouth. He didn't kick Goliath with prayer or with prayer points. He killed him because he was bold, confident in his God. He had confidence in his God. Actually, I think I've heard somebody said before that it wasn't even the stone or this thing that killed, killed Goliath. It was the word that David has already used on him. How can a small boy, <laughs> I got a small boy just come around and be like, I'm going to kill you and I'll give you a caca. No, was it the one that said that? No. He said, you are coming against me with, with uh, stave, with cutlass, with your army, but hey, I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus and I'm going to, the same God of the Israel that you have defiled his army. I'm coming to you with that God. So there was actually a way he talks to him. And he, Goliath have to be like, what? Am I a dog? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, wait, am I, am I supposed to be a dog or something? So before somebody will ask you, am I a dog? So you, 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 are, you could discern that this person has rubbished the other. So actually when you see some, some people, when they are fighting, they are having issues, they are quarreling. Some people now, some, I'm going to use somebody like me. If you are used to me, you know that I'm somebody with hard tone. Hard tone, authoritative utterances, and um, strong face. So imagine somebody looking at me, you're going to think that if you come close to me, I will devour you, I will beat you up. But meanwhile, I might not even have the power to do that. Well, because of the way I have appeared, maybe facially, maybe vocally, maybe uh, verbally, sorry, maybe verbally, maybe action, in action. So that thing, that's why there's the, 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 something like boldness in the realm of the spirit. Boldness actually does a lot. When you are somebody that is bold, Spiritually, even if, even if you can't do it, even if it's not going to be possible for you, even if, but, but you know, there are ways you pray. Let's just assume a, a lion, a lion is coming close to you and you just stand like this. You are looking at the lion and the lion is coming with all his, all his move, all its uh, uh, strength and everything. I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. The lion is going to get to some point and will stop. It's not stopping because it's for stopping. It's going to stop to know what your confidence is all about. Why are you so bold? It's going to stop him because when you see somebody that is just unnecessarily bold, you have to calm down and know where the person's strength lies. If the person has a knife, the person has a gun, the person has something that maybe you are just coming and the person is going to take you down. You don't know. So you, if you are somebody with calculate, calculative reasoning, you must stop. You must pause to understand why this person is having all this confidence. So that is why as children of God, confidence goes a long way. When we are bold, when we are confident, it can actually help us to bring down all of us. Amen. can actually help us to bring down all Lot of words can actually stop so many things, can actually hinder so many things, and it's going to pave a lot of ways for us. So that's why you see some people, people are just afraid of them, not entirely because they can do it, because of their boldness. So everybody is afraid. Everybody's there. There was a, a young man then in my school, 
they call him no strange name like that because of the level of strength they think he has. He beats almost everybody. He beats almost everybody around. He beats he beat this, he beats that, he beats that, he beats this, he beats that. Why? Because there is a way he carries himself. And there is a way he talks. He believes you are not up to him. He believes you can do him nothing. He just believes. But I'm sure there was also someone like that. And the report was like, where a little child just disgraced this person. So it's possible. Because of the way they come out, you are going to be so afraid. And that was what happened between the Goliaths and the armies of Israel. Because of the way he's so gigantic. So gigantic. So big. So everything. And his voice is, is roaring. He's thundorous. And with his, his, his troop and numbers of army, where anybody will be afraid, maybe me too, I'll be afraid. So now it takes boldness for you to be able to confront. That was why the, the armies of the Israelites, it's not entirely because Goliath was too strong that they couldn't withstand him. It was because he has killed their strength with his boldness. Yeah, he has weakened them. He has suppressed them with his stature, with his utterances, with his boasting. He has suppressed them. Come out! Oh, Definitely, someone that is even coming will be trembling already. Yo, this giant thing, you know, that fear already, it is fear that kills first. That's why you see some people, they have a sit and they die. Sometimes it's not only, sometimes you see somebody that just, a car is supposed to hit this person. And in contact, maybe the, the car, the, the driver, break immediately. So before the driver will break, and the driver didn't touch this person, the person will fall and will go into coma or will even faint. Now, you can testify now that the car didn't hit the person. What happened there was the fear, the shock alone of what is might befall, the fear of the unknown. That's one of the problems that that actually affects a lot of people that make them not to be able to confront their Goliath. I can see Mamadi is ready. Okay, now let's hear. What do you know about King David, man? Praise the Lord. You have said it all now. <laughs> oh, <me. laughs> why, why should I end? <laughs> anyway, like I said, I'm Sonia Cipre and Benedict, according to my father. <laughs> Nobody says it's the, the, the double anointing from the father. <laughs> yes. So how can you say and, somebody has said and, it? Or let's hear you. Amen. Uh, what I can understand is um, David. He was um, uh, he was he was not a, a an ordinary person like him, like him, most of us. But he was a man of faith with a good heart, very humble. If you see, he was not, he was, he was somebody, a God fearing person that he, he did not want to pay evil with evil. If we look all the all the stories that we hear, what happened with the uh, king's uh, king soul, he did not, he was somebody who was fearing the the anointed, the anointed ones of whom the most high God, he said, touch not my anointed ones. That is David for you. He was afraid to, 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 to offend or to, to do something evil to the anointed of God because he was somebody who respected God. He, he was somebody who, who fears God with, with all his heart that even the enemy, he will not kill because of the fear of God that was in him. He was somebody that when troubles comes, he will not look at people to, for help. What he will do, David, was to inquire to the Lord. He was somebody that he will comfort himself with the word of God. He will comfort himself, go to a, in a, a secret place. He will start to praise God with the names. He will glorify God in his situation. He was not somebody who will be gathering people to be talking, talking or to, no, no, for David, he was, he was always closer to his God in choir. Whatever he, will, he wants to do, David, he does not just do it. He will inquire first to the Lord. So 
I think I like the courage of David. No matter some people, they will say, yeah, yes, he was a human being. He was a human being with the blood like us. He committed the sin with the wife of uh, <laughs> the wife of uh, one of his uh, great warriors of uh, the warrior of um, war. That was it. Yeah, it can happen to all of us because you, anyone who is standing right with God, Satan will be after you. He just wanted to find something that will not connect for, for, for you to be disconnected from your God. But David, I like him now. Yes, he was a human being, he committed the sin. But what David, after committing sin, he we will immediately when he's rebooked, he will repent with all his heart. He will say, I am sorry, I have I have sinned against my God. So just like us, when we are we, we are human beings, we can commit sin, but are we willing to repent? Just like what King David, King David, he will repent immediately. He will repent and God. Because what Sister Sydney was saying, it was the relationship was like a husband and the wife. Where if you can quarrel, but because of that love, God, God had to forgive him because he was somebody who will repent from all his heart. He will not take time to repent. Immediately he will repent. Amen. Amen. That's what <laughs> Thank you very much, Mama D. Thank you so much. Yes, these are words of uh, wisdom and eye openings. Actually, I want to go with the first one you said. I want to go with that first. Actually, she said, David is a man that had respect for anointing. I want us to take very high cognizance of that part. He had respect for anointing. Actually, when I, you know, we, the, the one thing that we mostly knew about King David was that he was a man after God's heart, that he's a man after God's heart. But then the things that follows, we don't know. And also, we also know about his um, errors, his mistakes, and every other thing that he has done. Like, I was actually wondering, so what's so special about this man? That is the, honestly, I wondered within me, what's so special about this King David that makes him a man after God's heart, after killing Uriah, taking the wife, after taking a big game? When the husband, after the amount of women that he likes, what's so, what's so supreme about him? What's so special that like he's the man after God's own heart? But then when I come down to read, to read the account of King David, that was my conviction, what Mama D said. He had respect for anointing. So when I actually look at his life with King Saul, I was blown. I was blown away. The opportunities he had to kill the king, he didn't. Knowing the fact that the king was already rejected by God, he was still submitting under him. You know, and not only that the king was rejected, even the advances the king made towards him to kill him, he didn't make him to fight back or lost, um, lost respect for him. You know, when I look at these things, I look at the way he is so humble to repent and the way he's so broken and the way, you know, I just look at this man and say, and then I ask myself, when I, I was like, why won't this man be a man after God's heart? He's tender hearted. He's tender hearted. Not only for anointed, he had respect for persons. He had respect for persons. David is, um, is um, how do you call it? Is an example of a good man. I'm using a very simple English, a good man. He was a very good man and he was kind. Amen. He was a good man. That's just the gist. So, definitely, if you're a good person or if you're kind, you must be after the lost heart. Now, not only playing good, we must take note of that part not playing good. You know, goodness is from within. It's who you are. You don't act it up. You don't act it up. You don't um, try to be. It's from within. That is why you see some people, they are very brutal. And then when you try to know more about it, they will say, hey, my sister, I understand these things you are saying, no, but I've seen things. Men have shown me pepper. 
That's my change. Hey, my brother, me, I change. I cannot do this. One. You know, I change. They will tell you and of a truth. When you see their reasons, you will realize that they have reasons. But for them to have changed, that means it is not what they have inside of them. No matter the, the rain that falls on top of a mango tree, it will still bear a mango fruit. Set the tree on fire, let all the leaves wither. Anytime it wants to grow leaf again, it grows a mango leaf. Anytime it eventually wants to produce any kind of fruit, it will not produce different from mango. So the fact that you set it on fire, two years ago, does not mean that this year now that it wants to produce, it will not produce purple. That means it was never a mango. It was faking to be mango. If it is mango, 10 years later, if it have head to get up again, it will still bring forth mango fruits for the people to eat. And when you bring forth that mango, it's not gonna build an edge around it and say, touch not my fruits. It must still be open. It will still remain the same to still be exposed. And it's not gonna say it is only for my owner or those people that set me on fire at that time, they will not eat of me. Maybe those set of people that set it on fire, they will be the one that will even be climbing the tree. Have you ever seen where a tree grow ang grew angry and fall somebody? If you fall, you fall out of your carelessness. A tree does not have time to fall you. So even if you are the one that set it on fire last year, you will still come and climb, the fruit will not kill you. You will still eat the fruit and you will remain. So if you are a good person, it is, who, it is who you are. Situations cannot change you. You can be more careful, but it can't change you. Even in the midst of your carefulness, you realize you are still giving out the goodness. You realize you are still being kind. You just realize you are still lovely. You can't, you, 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 are, you too, you will be trying. That's why you see some people, they will say, hey, me, I've learned my lesson. I will never do anything free for somebody again because they take advantage of it. Tomorrow, somebody will still say this, okay, I can I will do it for you. No problem. They were the one that was boasting because it is who they are. They can't change. It is in them. Amen. So David was a good man. That's one thing I can say about him. And she also measured the fact that he comforts himself with God's word. I think he was the one that wrote the psalmist, Psalm 91, that my thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So the word is hidden. It is inside of him. So he, it, is, it is his comfort. It is his rest. It is his shield. The word is part of him. So he uses it to help himself. That's why you see whenever he's in problem, he will always compose his song and the song is going to the Lord. He will write a lamentation. He's addressing it to the Lord. He will write hymns. He's addressing it to the Lord. Only Sam, no matter what he's talking about, he's still addressing to the Lord. Obviously, he was, he was, the word of God was part of him. Amen. So I also have another thing here that said David was a brave man. I've actually talked about that. I think his braveness has a lot to do with his killing Goliath and now he killed the, um, the bear, the bear lion devourer in the bush with the sheep. So he was brave. You don't kill, you don't kill a wild animal with strength. You don't kill a wild animal with strength. You kill them with tactics. You kill them with tactics. So it's not with your strength. If it's with your strength, you end up putting your hand inside your mouth and they will cut it off. So you do it with that. So he was somebody that was brave. That was why he was able to confront, he was able to calculate. And that's why something they say that he was full of wisdom. David was born to rule. He was born to rule. So when you see somebody that leadership is inside his or her blood, you don't need to give or accord the person. I'm not gonna say you don't need to give the person a position before the person rules. Is inside of them. Is who they are, anything they are doing. That's why we, we are advised to channel, to try to help our children. 
that whatever gift they are, whatever they know how to do, for them to do it in the right way. So anybody that is born to rule, if the person is not born again, the person will lead somebody and lead them to hell because it's who they are. It's, it is a gift for them. The word of the Lord said, the, the Lord's gift is without repentance. If you are gifted to lead, you are gifted to rule. It's not, leadership is not only when you are, when you are in Christ. It, you manifest it anywhere, everywhere that you are, everywhere that you go. So if you are born to rule, so whatever you have inside of you, you will rule people. You will realize that people just want to be at your back. Even when you, you are trying to go back, they will keep pushing you forward. It's like they have confidence in your presence. Seeing you makes them bold. Seeing you makes them fulfill. They have this sense of joy when you arrive. Amen. So he was born to. So if you see his account, when he fled from Saul, he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't mobilize anybody. Just like we also talk about ministry now. There are some people, you see, when they, I'm going to use ministry, there are some people when they leave certain ministry, even when they don't want, people want to follow them. Even when they are not interested, because this thing is inside of them. People just like to be around them. It gives them, it's like their strength to this set of people. So David didn't ask for people. They came. I think he's, he's written in one of them. I don't want to go. I can't go there now. He was like, for peace? Do you come for peace? Because they came in, in hundreds. They came. They came to subject to him. I know it is as the Lord was leading. But then, so you could see that he was born for that. And he didn't start. So because he didn't have any mantle, to lead humans. He was leading the sheep because it is who he was, it is what he was born to do. His brethren were in the war front because he was born to rule. He was ruling in the desert, in the forest, ruling his animals, leading his animals. is part of him. He started from there before the Lord finally gave him a troop of armies that he was leading. He even when he was with Saul, he was still in the forefront. Because Saul was king, he cannot be in front of Saul. But he was side by side, bearing his armor. So you could see that it was inside of him. He might not have had knowledge on war. Obviously, he didn't have knowledge. But it didn't stop him from stepping forward. I think we've had this, this uh, class with Pastor C.Y., with my father. We have had it stepping forward and assuming a position. Nobody was able to step forward to confront Goliath. He will come and boast. I am even sure that Goliath didn't even come. Nobody even fought with him. Because according to the scripture, it's like, since nobody can fight him, he will take the children for captive. They will subject to them. Since nobody can fight him, they will subject. All he comes to do is to boast. As I was talking about boldness in the initial stage, all he comes to do is to boast. All he comes to do is to rant, is to make them fear. So because he was, David was born to rule, he, he, he couldn't just, because it is these same people that he was, he was born to rule. So that hunger was already inside of him. I'm sure he was, when he was in the desert, he didn't know about it. It was when he came to the war front to see his bread, he was like, what? What's going on here? You know, his statement, his first statement amazed me as young as he was. It was like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Hello, people with armor. They are afraid of the person you are calling uncircumcised Philistine. They fear him. They tremble at his voice. His sight makes them to quiver or to shiver. And you are calling him an you small boy, like we will say, you baby. What do you know? But now, having meet in him already, you must manifest. He manifested. And thank God who backed him up. Amen. We also know that the Lord also was in the mission of manifesting his power in that. But now, we're talking about 
humans, what we have, the gift that the Lord has put, in, put inside of us, and that of rulership was inside of King David, and he actually manifested. And we also have his boldness, which we have been talking about so much. And then we have his humble spirit. He's a humble man, which everybody knows about. And it has a lot to do with his tenderheartedness. It has a lot to do with his kindness. We're talking about King David. And then another part where I want to bring out other points is he took another man's wife. Ooh, news flash. He did it, actually. <laughs> Amen. Now, I think somebody already said he's human and he has weakness. And also, don't forget, he was a king up to now. Even as he's still one man, one wife. The kings, they still take a lot of wives. That's why if you see Romans, he said, let every soul be subject. I think it's Romans 13. Be subject to the higher power. Let me look for it. It's worth reading. It's a very powerful scripture. I think it's Romans chapter 13. Yeah. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. He said, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Hmm? I'm going to take three now. He said, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Without them, not be afraid of the power. Do that which is good, and that shall have praise of the same. So you see that lot of um, leaders or rulers or whatever it is, some of them, that power or the authority that they have, they don't really use it well. If you see the account of uh, first Samuel, when the Lord was going to give king to the Israelites, he told them, he said, the king that you will have, he will take your goods So They say, yes, they agree. He will take your children for slavery because they are not terror to good works. He will do this, he will do that. So you see, having authority, it makes you to lord over the people if you don't channel it to godliness. If you don't channel it to godliness. I think a pastor said, he said, the reason why David was even sorry and repenting is because he fears God. If he wasn't a man that fears God, that walked, why would he be sorry? He's a subject. He has, he has right to do what he please. He does what he chooses to do. Uriah is a subject, so can even tell Uriah, yeah, bring your wife. Uh, if I take your wife, will you not be happy? He will say, yes, sir. Because he's not terrible to good work. But because he wants to do good, he fears the Lord. He wants to work with the Lord. That was why. That he had the heart to repent. He had the heart to do nicely. He had the heart to be known because of, and that is what all of us, we should learn to channel our authority, our mantle, learn to channel it to do good, be to good works. Amen. So now I'm talking about the, um, the encounter with the wife of um, Uriah. First of all, you know, I realized that there are lessons also to learn from that particular incident. There are a couple of lessons to learn from that particular incident. You know, first of all, we are meant to understand that, um, the issue that we are meant to understand, we saw that, so I'm trying to open. I think that's a second Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11, we have the account there. That's one. And the other thing is, there were a lot of things that happened there. First of all, especially talking about um, the wife of Uriah, who realized that, uh, um, I'm not going to call it a carelessness, a carelessness, being careless with a body. I'm going to use that word because. Now, it was recorded that she was having a bath. She was having a bath, and in the course of that, he saw her. I'm sure, I don't really know how it is in the days of old, 
I'm sure if it was properly covered, he wouldn't have seen her bathing. If she was properly covered or whatever she's bathing, she's, she covered it, but it was secure. He wouldn't have seen her bathing. And also I know that now as king, they have authority and all this, but now her negligence, should I use that? Her attitude affected her husband. Her attitude affected her husband and it wasn't good. The outcome was not a good one. So it also means that anything we do, especially as children of God, it can affect people around us. It can affect our families. It can affect our children. It can affect our spouses. It can affect the people that looks up to us, especially people that looks up to us, it can affect them. So now, when we talk about doing good, doing righteously, doing things are right, we are not saying it for just you. It is more pointed to the people that are looking up to you. Now, Shibiti, today we always talk about it that, oh, because of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, that Adam and Eve ate, please forgive my background noise, that Adam and Eve ate, the, we up to date, we are still suffering for it. We always say it, and up to today, we are still saying it. When we talk about the case of, or the, the situation of Eve and the serpent, we talk about it as if it is today that it happens. Do you know why? Because it's still very fresh and it's still affecting us. It has affected us and it will still affect. Why? Because they failed. So the mistake they made is still affecting us up to date. Amen? Their error is still affecting us up to date. So the error you and I will also make, it can also affect a lot of people. If you and I will eventually make error, they are not careful. A lot of people can go down for it. Now let's bring it back to the case of Lucifer. So does it matter? Okay, let's also use him. I think he was the greatest in the kingdom as in, as angels. He was the greatest cherubim. He was the most handsome, the most beautiful, the most golden voice. But his attitude, so we also see a lot of people today. He's also affecting a lot of people. The Lord has given them voice. But instead of them to use it for the will of the Lord, rather they are using it against the Lord. If you want to check the most talented I would say the highest sales kind of music or whatever, they are secular songs. And I'm sure these were God's creature. He created them. Now let's come to the case of Christ. If Christ in his assignment to the planet earth, do you hear what God said? He said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Because he has seen it that he will not fail him again. Others have failed. He has trusted on others. Like I just used Lucifer. I'm sure before he would, he would, he would deposit this much in him. It's because he, 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 he trusted him. He entrusted him with the voice. He entrusted him with the music. He entrusted him with the beauty. He entrusted him with the glories. But what did he do? He turned around and began to rebel. Likewise, uh, uh, what is it called, Adam? Instead of him to, to, to watch what was put in his hand, it was rather, it is the woman you gave me. That was not the gist. Lord trusted you with this woman. You were supposed to protect her. You were supposed to teach her what she needs to know. You were supposed to rebuke her. You were supposed to, 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 to help her. Because now she's brought out of you. Obviously that means you know better than she does or you should have known. Let me use the word. You should have known better than she does. So the Lord, has, the Lord trusted him. Oh, it's not good for him to be alone. He pitied him. He fed for him. He borne his grief with, his grief with him. And he trusted him with the woman. But what was, his, what was the response? The woman you gave to me. Because me, but that was not, that was not, I'm sure that wasn't God's expectation. It wasn't his expectation. So he failed. He failed God with what he has given to him. 
But now coming to Christ, imagine that with all this already, with the battles at hand already, with the problems already, Christ ended up failing. Imagine that Christ has, has failed. Do you know how many of us would have been damned? Do you know how many of us would have been condemned? Do you know how many of us would have, like our, our issue shouldn't be talked about at all? After all, our issue we never talked about at the first place. And even those that their issue we had talked about, they had already failed. Imagine Christ has failed. Do you know how many, how many Many people it would have affected. And now a ministry was committed to Christ to reconcile the people back to the Father. Likewise, you and I today, a ministry is being committed into our hand. A mission is being given to us. An assignment is being given to us. Are you married? It could be that it is your wife that is an assignment that is given to you. You know, when you check the scripture, it said, as Christ loved the church, so ought husband to love their wife, even as he loved the church and sanctified it. And no, he said, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it unto himself as a holy church without spots. That means what you are supposed to do is what Adam was supposed to do. Sanctify this woman, work on her, help her to grow. Purge her, help her to be cleansed, and present her back to the one that has given her to you at the first instance. That's what you are supposed to do. So it's a ministry, it's a mission that has been that has been um, what is it um, given to you. It can be children that are given to you as a ministry. What you are supposed to do with them was supposed to present them back sanctify them back, present them as a spotless bride to the maker. Is it ministry? Or is it a church? A, a group of people, like a church now, we we'll call it a church, that has been given to you. You are supposed to work on these people. It is your priority that they grow so that you can bring them back, sanctify them to the church. Sorry, a, a sanctified church without spots. That's one thing that gets to me in that place. He said without spots. That means even the spots these people used to have before you met them, you are supposed to help them wash it off. If you fail, a lot of people will go down for it. I'm telling you the truth. If you fail, a lot of people will go down for it. There are some people that will stop praying when they hear anything bad about me. I'm not saying I'm a leader or something, but I am certain. There are some people that will stop serving God if they hear. I know someone, let me just use, let me just use someone. I worked with her before. Do you know that I have almost all her, I don't, she doesn't even have privacy again. All her details, emails, everything is with me. It's just like everything, everything is with me. There was even a day I saw some of her pictures. I was like, you better be careful with the kind of picture you take with your husband because I'm seeing everything here. I was expecting her to be like, what? So I don't have privacy, please. I don't want it again. She laughed and laughed and I said, I don't have privacy again with you. And she forgot about it. Why did she do like that? Because she trusted, I'm sure. She trusted that, oh, she's born again. She can't implicate it's me. Though she's born again, she can't do anything funny. She's born again, I'm sure. That was her, that's her confidence up to now. That's why she was able to, she laughed over it. She will not try that with someone else that is that she feels is not born again. So imagine that kind of person that is so free. Uh, yo, you, you, are a, you, are a, you are a Christian. Oh, let's go to heaven together. And then you now make error. What do you expect such a person to start believing? What do you expect such a person to start to think about godliness. That's why you see a lot of people who say, hey, please me, I don't want all those things. People are seeing people like this. Sometimes you don't blame them. They are telling you what they are seeing. Because a lot of people have come 
and they have failed. So now let me tell you to the newest born again person, to the newest, you got born again yesterday. Already people already looking up to you. You are saying, okay, <laughs> this actress, okay, let me see. If she can continue like this for six months, then me to give my life to Christ. And in the period of two weeks or two months, you fail. <laughs> they, too, they, will, they will go back. I'm sure there are a lot of traps they are setting for you and me to see if you will fall. If you eventually fall, a lot of souls will go down for it. You might not know about it. You might not know about it, honestly. You might not know about it. Except the Lord help. That is why you see nowadays, it is the Holy Spirit. When somebody genuinely accepts Jesus, the Holy Spirit will quickly embrace the person and begin to teach the person. If the person desires to know more, he begins to teach the person, he begins to help them to grow, he begins to help them to know more. Because if you want to entrust them wholly to human, they will fall. They will fall. So you see a lot of people that are still standing today is the grace of God. Because everybody that there are a lot of people, let me not use everybody, a lot of people that they are looking up to, they are failed. So it's just mercy that is keeping them. But everybody will not have it. There are a lot of souls that is attached to your conversion. You are saved to save others. You may not entirely preach to them. People that used to know you, your family members that know who you are, you may not entirely preach to them. They may not hear your preaching. That is why he said, he said, so or the, wife, the wife to subject to her husband so that even if, he said with shamefacedness and sobriety, so that even if the man does not obey through the word, he doesn't believe through the scripture, Jesus love you, he died, you quote Isaiah 2, 2, Matthew 10, 10, the other one 5, 5, even if he didn't believe through that one, but through the attitude of you that is now born again, through your chest conversation, the way you now behave, you now like, ah, ah, I think this woman, she has said something new. That is what is going to convert a lot of people. Or some people. You might, not, you might not even know them. You've never seen them before. Let me tell you, some people get converted not because of what you preach. The person that will say through her, I get converted. I'm not sure I really heard messages from her not because of what she preaches. But I just, I just like her. I want to be like her yesterday. So if it was the word, it was a different case. And now maybe she that I like, I want to be like her, and I start to see error. And the Lord doesn't help me out for. Because I didn't come through the word. I came through her attitude, through her appearance, through this, through this, through her smiles. These are what I came with. Amen. So there are a lot of people that will go down for it. Uriah's wife, a mistake, took the life of her husband. I don't want us to be ignorant of that part, that the, her mistake took her husband's life. So that's for that. Another thing is, don't try to cover the truth. So you realize that the truth of the matter was that Uriah's wife was pregnant. The truth of the matter was that David had had intercourse with her. The truth of the matter was that, what else, what else, what else, what else? What else? the deed has been done. What David was trying to do, that is why you see sin. If you commit one sin, you don't repent immediately. It will lead you to another sin. From that other sin, it will enter another one. Sin escalates from one to the other, to the other, to the other. Before you know, it becomes part of you. So you see some people that you, or you'll be looking at and say, ah, ah, this person has busted there. Let's pray. I'm telling you sometimes, this person doesn't know. She doesn't see his or herself that they are backslidden. They just think they make error and they are still trying to recover from one to the other, to the other, to the other. They say, let's just try. Okay, I'm going to try to see how can, to the other before you know. <laughs> but let's just forget our back. All this pride wouldn't let them help it. Don't try to cover the truth. I think that was one thing that David usually had, but this time around, he didn't have it. It's somebody that doesn't cover, he always open it. But well, this time around, he was trying to cover it. So you see how, how dangerous it could be to cover truth. And I'm sure when Uriah came, he could have easily said, my son, please forgive me. I've made an error. Please forgive me. 
I'm sorry, please. Even if he knew that, I'm sorry, because Raya was a noble man. I'm sure he would have forgiven him. It would have hurt him, or he would have forgiven him. Sorry, he would have forgiven him. I'm just sure. If he would have humbled himself and take him to one corner and beg him. And also the wife beg him. He would have. But he didn't take that step. He didn't take that step, but rather he was looking for how to bend it, to cover it, to cover it. Sin is meant to be disgraced. That's one attitude I'm still praying for God to help me. Sin is meant to be disgraced. As a woman, you, you, I don't know, maybe you, you get to lose with another man. You are supposed to disgrace that attitude to your husband immediately. But you see, I, sorry, there was something like, I didn't even know what came over me. The way I would just, the way I would just in public, I just get loose. Disgrace that sin else. Trying to cover it, you will try to cover it. Nepal assist them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Through one sin. I'm glad we don't have Nepal here. <laughs> Through one sin to the other, to the other, to the other. You will realize that before you know, you just want to quit your marriage and follow the other man. Let peace reign so that he will not see you as a cheat, as a howler. Let me just do it and, and just enjoy my life. To disgrace sin, to expose it. Sin is a bastard that needs to be dealt with. Because it, it, hates, it hates to be exposed. He doesn't like it. He loves secrets more than any other thing. I'm still praying for God to help me to have that attitude to disgrace sin. There are ways you disgrace sin. Oh, my days. I've heard people talk to me. They'll be like, well, I just did this and I told my wife. I just did this and I was asked to preach in the church. Before I preach, I would tell them, I say, please pray for me. I just masturbated. Please pray for me. Sometimes I'm just like, wow. This is, can people be this, be this cruel to sin? <laughs> can they be this, be this merciless to sin? I want to have that attitude to expose it before it expose you. So if he had disgraced that sin, the sin wouldn't have taken its cause so strongly in him. Sorry, I'm sure it wouldn't have eaten him that day. So we must learn it. Don't cover it. Don't, don't, don't give it a room because you know, just like a hen, mother hen, the reason why she covers her hen, her cheeks, is because she wants them to be nourished. She wants them to grow. She doesn't want the heat or sun to torment them. When you catch a snail, if you have ever caught a live snail, when you catch the snail, well, the next thing you want to do, you want to cover it in a cool place. Why? Because you don't want it to die. That is sin. If you keep it in a cool place, it will never die. It will continue. And if you leave that snail there, you realize it's growing. Anything you keep somewhere is growing. Maybe you have the food, you continue to give it to it, it's growing. So that is sin. As you cover it, it begins to grow as the day goes by, as the hour goes by, as the minute passes by, it begins to grow. So we must disgrace it to the latter. So that's one thing there, another thing there. And I know now the problem, one of the problem with us, especially as believer is ministerial pride. Now ministerial, not only church, church team, no, not only church team, ministerial pride. It's one of the reasons why we cannot really expose sin. Because, oh, how we people, now I'm going to use uh, leaders as an example. I'm sure they call it ministry now, ministry of this, ministry of that. You lead us as, as an example. Then now, a leader will not come out and say, hey, well, I'm sorry, I, I joined the robbers. I was the one that supplied them ammunition. They will never try it. Never. Even when they are caught, they will never try it. But if they were ordinary people, I'm sure, let me use the word ordinary people, they would have 
easily say, please forgive me. It was the work of the devil. But a leader would, would hardly do that. Now, to ministry, ministerial pride will not let you. He's going to fight you to the latter and say, hey, hey, you, do you know me people are looking up to you? You want to say you did this? That right. Your ministry is dead. And I like the word, your ministry. Your ministry. Your ministry is dead. If you try it, your ministry. You know, that those small girls that used to talk to you anyhow. If you just start this one, they will not, they will just, they will just finish seeing you. And the the see finished ministry will just come in. You know? Also, with marriage, moral pride won't let us. Me that my husband knows as a Christian, how can I confess this? Me that my wife knows, me that used to discipline her, me that used to tell her that other girls they are smelly, how can I do this? Moral pride won't let us. So we must, we must learn to kill this, this pride that want to kill us. It is what we must kill. We don't need to joke with it. Amen. It's something we don't need to joke with. We must learn to kill the pride that want to kill us before it kill us. Don't nourish sin. We don't have to nourish it. We don't have to. We don't have to. It's not necessary because it's not welcomed in any area of our lives. Sorry. In any area of our lives, it's not welcomed. We don't have to welcome it. We don't have to allow it to kill us. Another thing that I also saw, like I, we just talked about, don't try to cover the truth, which was the case of Raya, wife, and David. So we must swallow our pride for the sake of righteousness. I think I added the two together. We must swallow our pride for righteousness sake. Like we often say for God's sake, for righteousness sake. To be honest with you, I'm a kind of person since I was young. I don't know, maybe it's because of the way I talk, I don't know. I hate to say sorry. I don't like it. So what I try to do, I try to keep my standard. I don't want to look for your trouble. I don't want to be at the, the wrong end. So if you look for my trouble, I can give it to you too far. But I don't want to look for your trouble so that I will not come back later and start saying I'm sorry. I don't like it. So I don't even say it. Even when I'm wrong, I don't know how to say sorry. I will still be carrying my face. But for righteousness sake, we must, we must learn it. Now, not only in this story wise, I'm just using this as an example. We must, we must learn it to be humble. We must swallow it. If not, it will blow us up. We must swallow our pride for righteousness sake. Learn to apologize. Learn to humble. Learn to, to come down. We know some of us even want to apologize. We see apologize in pride. Ah, I'm really sorry for that, which I've done. I, it was not my intention. Please, let's just forget about it. Are you the one to tell me to forget about it? Are you here to tell me sorry or you are here to tell me to forget? You're not the one to forget it in my head. It's in my head. You only know how you felt. You don't know how I fe felt about it. So you can't just tell me to forget about it. You didn't know what happened. No, now you might know what happened, but you didn't know how it eats me up. That's the problem. You didn't know how deep this thing ate me up. So it's no, it's no right for you to come from nowhere and tell me, say, let's just forget about it. No, because you didn't know how I felt at the first place. So if you want to apologize, calm down and apologize. Cry. Let me see your tears if necessary. Maybe through seeing your tears, my heart will melt too. Say something. Don't, don't cover it. Because some of our apologies, we are trying to cover, close the case. Don't close the case. Open, the, open it like a check. Let it be so as Open it. Talk about it. Ah, I, I could, I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm so sorry. Ah, you showed that I was so displeased with myself to see that I have done this to you. It's not the person that will not say, it's okay, it's okay, let's forget about it. Not you telling the person, let's forget about it. If you are the wrong end, amen, we must learn to expose it. And I think another thing is that um, don't work with emotion. I think I will stop in this particular one. No, one more. <laughs> don't work with emotion. Emotions is dangerous in anything that we do. I think we women, we are, we are usually full of that. <laughs> My husband usually said, if a woman wants to preach, she will preach with the way she feels. 
She doesn't preach what is right. She preach her feelings. And that's true. I've observed it with a lot of people. Maybe when somebody, maybe when somebody lies against them. Oh, when they want to leave prayer. Oh, say my father. Every standard risen against me to break me down. Is that the prayer the Holy Spirit would have really loved you to pray? They pray with their emotion, how they feel. So your feeling becomes our prayer point. Your feeling is not my feeling. Your desire is, I came to, to look for marital settlements, not to pray that everybody that is that lied against me should be exposed. That's not what I want. I want power against my marriage to die, not people that lie against me. You were the one they lied against, not me. So if you are leading me, let the spirit lead you. Don't work with emotion. I don't know if I'm making any sense. You don't need, don't work. It, it, will, it, will, it will be cloud your sense of reason. Emotion, it be clouds your sense of reasoning. You will not reason properly. You, re, you only feel it the way you feel that matter. You only believe is your belief that counts. It be clouds your sense of judgments. So don't work with emotions, don't work with sentiments. That's why if you must be a leader, that's, that's why you see leader, like our pastor already told us, is a ministry. If you don't have it, it's going to be tough. It's a ministry because a, a heart of a leader is a heart of lion and a heart of lioness. Leaders are the ones that are able to put their own feeling aside and let your own feeling and, 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 and do the needful. It's just like, for the fact that my husband maltreats me, it doesn't mean that all men are bitters. But we want to ask a woman that is working with emotion. So what do you think? What do you think about men? <laughs> men, they are bitters. They are women bitters. Men are brutal. Men are so insatiable. Now, I can relate that your husband has this attitude. But my husband might not have it. I can relate that my husband has these attitudes. But your husband might not have it. So why should all men be that way? And somebody that is enjoying a marriage is going to be like, how can a man be bitter? My own husband pampers me. How can men be bitters? How can women be, be, be strong-hearted? But I try to submit to my husband. So you don't, you don't work it out with emotion. I think the problem with King David here was emotion. He couldn't control his emotion and think aright. He allowed his emotions to be cloud his sense of judgment. We must be careful of it. I used to be like that. I don't know if I'm still like that now. If I'm angry, don't call me. If you call me, you are in trouble because I'm going to transfer every iota of aggression that I have in you. Hello? Eh? You say? I'm not hearing you, job. Please get out. Because somebody just offended me and you call into the play, you are in trouble. The person will be wondering, what happened? What is it? Are we quarreling? Are we fighting? Until somebody understood me and the person said, you know what? If you're angry, don't pick us. Don't pick us. Allow, your, allow it to subside. Then you can talk. Amen. Then you can talk. Because are you going to ruin that person's day because of your own emotion? So you are, you are going to ruin my day just because your day has been ruined. <laughs> I saw a write-up that a lecturer that does not have a happy home is the one that, that feeds class 6 a.m. just to make sure that all the students are angry. How can you fix a class for 6 a.m.? So for the fact that your wife is giving you stress, you are looking for a way to live up, does that mean that you should ruin other people's day? No, don't ruin other people's day. <laughs> your own day can be ruined, okay? We look for people to help you fix your life, not trying to destroy everybody's life with your emotion. I think that was what happens here. Our humble king has failed. But hey, you don't have to take the poor man's life for your failure. Don't work with emotion. Be calm. So, and also when you don't, don't think out of emotion. When you're emotional, you can't get anything straight. Let it die first. Let it be calm. In as much as it might not be convenient, it might not be okay, it might not be this, but at that time, just breathe in, breathe out, think straight. In short, go and relax. Go and rest your head. Maybe somebody is calling you for counseling 
And you are not in the right frame of mind. You are not even hearing the person properly. Why trying to speak? Are you going to take the place of the Holy Spirit now? Obviously, you might not even get it straight. Why don't you tell the person, okay, you know what? We are going to talk about this later. Because you know at that time, you are not in the right frame of mind. You might not make a right judgment. You might not speak a right. After quarreling with your husband or maybe your child. I'm trying to look for what to use. Okay, let me just use husband. They are closer. After calling on someone else came and said, Oh, my husband, I don't know what to do to please please men. Can you please men? Who pleases men? Men, no matter what you do for them, they will never appreciate. That's men for you. But that, I'm, I'm sure that isn't what you were supposed to say. So for the fact that your husband felt on your husband uh, appears unappreciated doesn't mean that her husband was like that maybe she was wrong so because of your emotion you, you you your judgment now is wrong what if it was the person the lady that was wrong and the husband was right so now just because of the experience you are going through with your husband now you just want to use it to talk to her we're going to give her more moral moral Zara, i'm going to give her more boldness to 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 to, to misbehave again and the same men are this the same men I saw when you see, see ladies that yeah, their marriage is not working out. When somebody wants to marry, they say, hey, you want to marry? <laughs> My brother, you have to be careful because marriage is not an easy thing. Hello? Marriage is not an easy It has not been easy for you. So the person should not marry now. To help you and mourn for your own. Now, sorry, I'm not trying to, to, to mock our infirmity. I'm just trying to bring out how we could talk with emotion. Or, or our emotions could be clad a sense of judgment. So everybody's not going to stay and mourn your marriage. Life has to go on, go on until the Lord vindicates you, until the Lord has his way. Now it's, it's okay. Now you can express your own feeling, yes. But now we're talking about our senses of judgment. So honestly, emotion is bad for judgment. It's bad for decision is bad for behavior, is bad for display, being your right frame of mind. Even if you could say that there are times you are overwhelmed, maybe you are tired, you would try to force yourself to do something, you can't even do that thing properly because you are tired. You don't have the strength. Someone once told me once upon a time, I cooked, I, I fried egg, the egg was just rubbish. After tasting, they told me like, this thing is not nice. So you know what, if you are tired, go and rest. Because in the whole house, there were a lot of people in the house. I was literally doing everything. I would do this. I would do, everybody was just leaving it for me. I would do this. I would do this. I would do this. I would do this. Try it for me. Do this for me. Do that for me. And I fried the rubbish. <laughs> it was like, we know you are trying. If you are tired, just go and rest. Okay? Because honestly, you can't do it well. So give yourself a break before you speak, before you act. Let the issue be there. No matter how much, I think that was what also happened to King Saul. He worked with emotion. Emo oh, they are coming. Oh, the people say, oh, he ended up until today now. I'm sure he's in hell. You can imagine this. King Saul was a good man. Let me not use the word good man. At least he was trying. To the best of before he fell, he was trying. I didn't really see what he did wrong. But because he, he didn't, he, 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 he acted too emotionally. He allowed his emotion to ruin his ministry. It spoiled things for him. So let's be calm. I think myself, I really need to learn from it as well. We must let it die. And the last that I have here, not to take our time too much, is cover up. Cover up. David has been seeing a lot of women. If he hadn't seen a naked woman, he wouldn't have ordered for her. As a woman, you must learn to cover up. I, I don't know why it's becoming a negotiable thing these days. It shouldn't be negotiable. It shouldn't even be preached. It's something you are supposed to know by yourself. You don't even need somebody to remind you to cover up. Because when people see your nakedness, it can lead to problems. And it can ruin your family. 
you see that Uriah's wife nakedness, Bathsheba nakedness that was seen killed her husband. It was the nakedness that in David saw that killed her husband. Cover up. If you don't value yourself for other people's sake, for other people's soul, for their sake, even if you don't have conscience, cover up. Do you know how many people you bring down every day with your nakedness? Do you know how many souls you pollute every day with your nakedness? People now go on the internet just to tweet people's picture and they are masturbating with the picture. Just a picture because they are naked. They watch a video, they are seduced. They watch a movie, they are seduced. They see picture, they are seduced. A lady passes by, they are seduced. Somebody is moving. Can we stop this? Can we try? Let me tell you where you see. When I say cover up, let me tell you what I mean. As a lady, when you wear clothes, cover your armpit first. It's a public region, it's a private part. At least let something be covered up to your neck, or to at least, yeah, at least. Let from your, you know, any place that seems like it's coming down to your breast downward, let it cover. Please don't be too shape revealing with your dress. In case you don't know, let me try to, sorry, try to explain a bit more. Don't be too shape revealing with your dress. People are looking at you and they are falling. That's the problem. You look fine in it, yes, but people are falling. Souls are perishing. You might not understand, it might not make sense to you because you are not hunting for soul. By the time you start to hunt for soul, you will understand better. Again, your laps, let it cover. At least up to your knee. Everybody must not wear something that is creeping on the ground. At least cover from this place now. Eh? From this, your chest up, upward, down to your knee below. And you can leave the rest, it's your business. But at least cover it. Because you must not cover your neck, but cover your chest. Is very important, please. So that's all we have today, and that's all I can say about King David. We pray the Lord help us to maintain the right stand. Every good thing we have said about King David was good. So these are the things we want to emulate. The good parts. So we pray the Lord help us to maintain these good parts in Jesus' name. Sorry, I know I was supposed to moderate. I'm not supposed to handle why should continue. <laughs> Thank you so much. Glory to God Almighty. We thank God for His um for the time He has given us. It's um, amazing. Yeah, we learned how as.